block of issues. The question of regulation, cybersecurity, taxation, and other related matter. Mr. Tom Wilkinson, Head of Machine Learning and Analytics at Department for International Development, United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Um, so I thought I'd change these slides to have my DFID email address, but I've not. Uh, I do work for the UK government. You'll notice throughout that I don't have particular branding emblazoned on the slide, and that's partly because I'm a good civil servant and I don't believe in wasting public money on lots of snazzy visuals. But it's also because I, uh, it, it, you should all be aware there isn't a single UK government position on blockchain. Um, and therefore, a lot of what I'm saying today will be my own view on this as someone who acts as an advisor to departments within the UK government um, when they're approached about applications of blockchain. Now, I've heard the UK government criticized for not having a position where some other governments, like, say, Singapore, do have a very clear position. Personally, I think it's not unreasonable to be staying quite cautious and skeptical in this space because fundamentally, we still don't understand very much about how blockchain can be effectively used. The technology is still evolving. Um, certainly, the public versions um, have issues with scalability that are, have promising solutions in the works, but have not yet been uh, delivered. Where did the UK government's work on blockchain start? It started in 2015 with the chief scientific advisor for the UK government, Sir Mark Walport, pulling together a round table of academics and officials to try and understand what the potential applications of the technology were. This report was published in 2016. There were a number of recommendations made, um, such as establishing a regulatory framework, uh, applying the technology for identification and authentication, making use of the technology in live trials or proofs of concept. Um, and my uh, particular suggestion to the report was that we make sure we've built internal expertise within government. And since then, until now, I've been coordinating a community of interest across the UK government to try and raise officials' understanding of what the technology can and can't do through engagement with academia and the startup sector. The other three recommendations I've highlighted here are still a work in process, progress, but as I say, there are fairly good reason, reasons to take this slow and not rush into applications of something that is still not fully mature in its technology and I personally think still not fully understood in where it's applicable. But let's talk about some of the applications that have been tried in the UK. Now, before 2015 and that report, the government digital service in the UK was already using one of the components of blockchain, something called Merkle trees, to establish what it calls canonical registers. So where you want to have a definitive list of something that everyone can share and use, uh, and that might sound like a trivial thing to have, but as someone who works with databases all day every day, actually having a single version of the truth across lots of different applications is really, really hard to achieve. So these canonical registers use the components of blockchain, something called a Merkle tree, to achieve a very quickly checked consistency of information across a bunch of different places. Now, more recently than that, the government digital service has been helping the land registry in the UK look at the applicability of blockchain to securing um, land rights and the exchange of these. The Department for Work and Pensions in the UK, as early as 2015, was exploring a proof of concept to deliver people's welfare payments to their mobile phones. Now, from that point onwards, it was claimed that blockchain was a part of this solution, and you may well have heard that. You will have seen it if you've read the chief scientist's report. It's still not clear what part blockchain was playing in that system, and the reason for that is because, essentially, if this, the message hasn't landed already today, blockchain is a data decentralization technology. It does very little more than just making sure that there's not a single point of attack on the data to change the data. Now, if you have a centralized distribution system where you have another obvious point of attack on the data, 
decentralizing the data may not deliver all that many benefits. And I'll come back to that in a second with some criticisms of a lot of the proposed applications of blockchain. How about DFID, my own organization? So we have a number of proofs of concept out there um, being explored. For example, tracking humanitarian stockpiles of resources, how many bed nets, how many first aid kits are held by different humanitarian agencies, so that there's a clear record of that when it comes to deploying those to the field. Why would blockchain, why would a data decentralization technology be useful here? Because we've got a number of those intergovernmental organizations all interested in this space, and no single central authority that spans the whole world that one might trust to keep track of data for them. Um, so we're exploring that. Um, equally, we have a project to look at digital identity to try and understand whether blockchain or other digital solutions could help deliver identity in fragile states, in um, refugee situations around the world. Equally, we have a project that is running at the moment with support from um, a Barclays accelerator startup and provenance and a number of other key players in the blockchain world looking at tracking supply chains and specifically for tea. And this mirrors some other proofs of concept that other government departments in the UK are looking at. Um, another application that's been explored, the cabinet office in the UK, a, a central function of the UK government, brings in academic researchers on secondment to help do research into the feasibility of emerging technologies. One of the things we explored, and there are some blog posts about this quite recently from the Ministry of Justice, was whether blockchain could be used to secure criminal evidence chains. Again, although generally our public institutions are trusted, to make sure that they're above reproach in terms of the handling of evidence, having an immutable ledger that can't be tampered with, even by a single database administrator looking after it, uh, could provide extra assurances in the, uh, the administration of civil justice. Back to supply chains, the tax department in the UK, HMRC, DEFRA, which is our agricultural and food agency, and our food standards agency, have all been exploring the applicability of blockchain and wider distributed ledger technologies for securing supply chains. So understanding the provenance of goods as they come into the UK, um, or food goods as they move around within the UK. And I'll talk shortly about my personal opinion on, on how effective those uses are. Another application being explored by our Department for International Trade and UK Export Finance, again with support from the Cabinet Office and academic secondees, is the use of blockchain as an infrastructure to support the delivery of finance supports, uh, so, so loans in support of UK exporters operating around the rest of the world. Now, this is something that lots of banks get involved in, and they need, to, uh, they need the UK government to vouch for part of the risk um, that comes in when they support these smaller exporters. So blockchain seems, to an extent, like a natural infrastructure to support that peer-to-peer -peer system of banks potentially into lending. Now, outside of government, there's a thriving UK research scene on blockchain. I sat on the panel for the Research Council UK in awarding funding to a number of programs exploring potential applications. Voting, a key one of these. First of all, in corporate votes, but that project will move on to look at national elections as well. And again, coming back to blockchain as a decentralized data infrastructure, it's quite obviously a setting where one would worry more than others about the incumbent decision makers controlling the data infrastructure underneath the vote, because they have the most incentive to tamper with that data. Uh, and that's why that's an interesting application. The National Archives of the UK do things like recording the outcomes of criminal proceedings and the video from them, because in precedent-based common law in the UK, these will then affect the outcomes of subsequent hearings. Now, this, of course, means that attacking that data, changing that data, could have dramatic repercussions for the outcome of subsequent criminal hearings, and so there are plenty of incentives there to tamper with that data. So, of course, 
securing our national archives uh, to prevent tampering with that data is uh, an obviously beneficial use of blockchain and one where that decentralization of data could pay off. UK financial services, with the increase of algorithmic trading at very, very high velocities, there becomes a problem with regulating that. Um, if a trading actor can change, their al change the uh, algorithms monitoring trade for a short space of time, commit some illegal transactions, and then change them back, that could go very much undetected. The volumes of data are beyond a human's ability to process. And so they have to be monitored algorithmically. So to prevent those algorithms being tampered with, a decentralized solution like smart contracts on a distributed ledger could be one way to prevent fraud in, in financial trading. Um, and that was one of the other projects we funded. And then a final project, or two in fact, were around micro energy production and micro trading of energy. These peer-to-peer -peer settings where you don't have an obvious central actor because two parties are trading electricity are an obvious one to secure with DLT because you already have a decentralized system. And so having a decentralized data layer just makes good sense. Now, the two projects we funded, one was focused on the UK and another in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we're still waiting with all of these projects to get the final outcomes, but there are some really promising developments already that I think could inform wider use of DLT. What is the market doing? So you'll have heard already today about lots of exciting potential applications, and they are exciting, but all of them so far, I think there are some obvious criticisms just logically before you get to the proof of concept. Um, and we need to be very wary about thinking that blockchain is ahead of where it is, that we know how to use it yet. So for example, applications for trading diamonds and keeping track to prevent conflict diamonds from entering supply chains. Well, that's all well and good if you can uh, attach a digital identity to each diamond. If you can find physical properties of the diamond that you can log in a blockchain, because blockchain will only protect data, it won't protect physical assets from changing, then maybe you can track the diamonds. But what's to stop a diamond, a conflict diamond, being brought in by one of these mines that is able to certificate the diamonds and thereafter being treated as if it is above suspicion. So there are still points of attack as long as there are other bits of the system which are still centralized. Um, the same could apply with fish quotas, where we might trust a fish quota to stop uh, within a particular market any fisherman selling more fish than they're allowed to. But unless the whole world market is covered by that blockchain solution, how do we make sure that the fisherman doesn't just buy in or, or sell out their overcatch to the part of the world economy that isn't using blockchain to, to secure the fishing rights. Um, a popular and one of the earliest examples of uh, proposed applications of DLT was the financial institutions, so R3 I'm sure you'll all have heard of. And, and to me this makes fairly good sense. You have a system of peers with no trusted central authority, the big banks need to keep track of their mutual financial position. It costs them quite a lot every year in accountancy fees and legal fees to work out who actually owes what um, in terms of their, sort of their customers' transactions across the, bank, the bank's boundaries. Um, and yet they have no trusted central authority. If any one of them held this single ledger, then the others wouldn't trust them not to tamper with it. So a good application. I think we're still yet to see whether R3 uh, and Corda can actually deliver a solution that the banks will cooperate with. Um, much like the, uh, I've not mentioned it here, but the Maersk and IBM pilot that has been going on and maybe faltering now for international shipping, where although decentralization makes good sense in this peer-to-peer -peer setting, you've got two big players there in terms of IBM and Maersk who have incentives for it not to be fully decentralized. Um, so we have to be careful there. Academic records, we have to be careful about what is the list of people or institutions that can award academic credentials, because ultimately, you don't need to attack the credentials on a blockchain if you can just add an extra university to the list and submit fake certificates through that. So again, there's a point of attack because it's not fully decentralized. With land rights, um, one of the biggest problems in countries, develop, less developed countries, where a decentralized land rights solution might be a benefit because there isn't a good centralized option. 
One of your biggest problems is we don't know who owns what now. The informal land rights in place, we need to find a way to digitize that information before sticking it on a blockchain could help. So with all of these potential applications, great, promising, but there are still hurdles to overcome before I think any of them actually make that much sense. So what are the key questions that I'd ask in my last 20 seconds about any proposed application of blockchain? First of all, can you deliver the efficiency that's being proposed through some central mechanism? Because if you can, then you don't need decentralized data infrastructure. Second, is it actual decentralization? Decentralizing the data infrastructure, great, but actually if there's another easy point of attack in the system, no one's going to trust the data anyway because it could be manipulated through there. And then, last of all, does it scale down? So like that example with the fisheries, it's all well and good if your decentralized solution would work for the whole world if everyone's already bought in. But if it doesn't work for a small group to get it started, if it needs everyone involved to have the critical mass, then it's, it's not going to work and grow. So these would be the cautionary questions I would ask to any of my colleagues in the UK government when they were approached by someone trying to sell blockchain technologies. Um, like a lot of the technical problems, like scalability, energy consumption, I'm sure there are ways that we will overcome these things, some of them in the near future, but I still haven't seen solutions which address a lot of these problems. So that's my challenge to the people here who are from the private sector and academia. Answer these questions, please. And I'm done. Thank you very much.